Hi everyone, I'm Rika, and I'm I'm excited to welcome all of you today to the to our session on charity entrepreneurship, the why, what, and who. The talk will make up most of the session. After the talk, we will then have a Q&A, which will be live. And to help us facilitate the Q&A later, please forward or type in any questions you might have for Steve in the live discussion question portion on swap card. There you can upvote each other's questions so Steve can answer the most pressing ones live later. Now we're clear on the session and Q&A format, it is my pleasure to introduce you to my colleague, Steve Thompson, who's our speaker for today. Steve studied philosophy and entrepreneurship. He worked for 10 years in the corporate sector as a senior leadership development consultant. Steve also launched his own school for entrepreneurs. He co-founded Training for Good, an EA method charity that focuses on tech policy and journalism. And right now, he works at Charity Entrepreneurship, one of the major EA organizations. Here's Steve Thompson. Hello, you're very welcome. Your career, talent, and time are the most valuable assets you have to help improve the world. So can you imagine the impact that you could achieve by starting a whole new charity? I'm Steve, I co-founded Training for Good, and I work with Charity Entrepreneurship. And prior to this, I worked in the corporate sector as a leadership consultant. And the purpose of this short session is to give you the opportunity to really consider if founding a charity is for you. Okay, so you're probably immediately thinking about, well, fit, failure, and alternatives. But before we get into all of that, let's look at why being a founder is even worth considering. And as we do, I should, you know, a hefty disclaimer here. I'm totally biased. As I said, I work for Charity Entrepreneurship. I launched my own charity. And so a healthy pinch of salt would be appropriate here as you listen to me. Um, but we're going to look at things like scale, neglectedness, tractability, those kinds of things. When you think of a hero, you might think of somebody like this, the paramedic, uh, or one of these guys. But few people think of Ellie Hassenfield or Esther Duffalo. Um, but these are people, real people, entrepreneurs, charity founders, and they've saved a life, indeed many lives perhaps, for every day they've lived. So let's take a, a look at a couple of specific people like this, and maybe they're a little bit more relatable as well. So two years ago, the research team at Charity Entrepreneurship identified lead poisoning as a pressing and under-resourced problem. It causes 902,000 deaths a year, 1 trillion in, in lost income globally, uh, but there was only about 11 million in donor funding going to it. So it's costing trillions and it's uh, it's getting 11 million. So we recruited Jack and Lucia, two young EAs, very much like many of you, to start the Lead Exposure Elimination Project. Neither Jack or Lucia had any experience in lead or poisoning or lobbying governments. Uh, they were smart and committed and willing to step up to the plate and try. And within three months, they convinced them allowing uh, Bureau of Standards to enforce regulations and to get lead paint off the shelves. Uh, two years on, their work has protected about 215,000 children from lead poisoning, and this is the equivalent of about 43,000 DALI equivalents averted. So not too bad. Um, and, and now they've ongoing campaigns in eight countries, and they're just getting started. And this talk is about how we find these ideas, how we train those founders, and how well it works, and why, most importantly, it might be for you. So... I want you to imagine that Rob Mather, who started the Against Malaria Foundation, just decided not to start it. Just for a moment, just consider that. So he could have just stayed in his consulting job, um, but he didn't. He stepped up to the plate. He, uh, he didn't have a lot of experience with anti-malarial bed nets. Uh, he didn't have much ex expertise in malaria, but he just said, this has to happen. Nobody else is going to do it. I'm going to do it. So just imagine for a moment he hadn't done that. That's 200 million bed nets that wouldn't have been distributed. 200 million bed nets that wouldn't have gone out there and saved lives. He saved maybe about three lives just since I've been, uh, just since I've been talking. In fact, if we zoom out a little bit, all of the Give Well top recommended charities were started by someone, a person, you know, who really didn't know how it would go. And it's almost certain none of them knew how important their work would become. In fact, Give Well itself, Imagine um, Ellie Hassan, uh, sorry, Holden or Ellie just stayed as an investment analyst. That means no give well and no open fill. But going even further, imagine Will McCaskill hadn't started 
giving what we can in CEA and EAGs by extension. So all of us here today, much of the good that we will do in our careers stems in part from a founder, from somebody pushing over the first dominoes and creating the container within which we'll all act. Joey Savoy from Charity, uh, Charity Entrepreneurship, he started Charity Entrepreneurship. So if he hadn't done that, perhaps all of the charities that um, CE have launched, all 23 of them, a lot of that good would just evaporate from the planet. So sometimes the most important thing to do is to say, I'll do it, I'll step up to the plate. And ultimately, everything is started by someone and we need more someones. So give well, animal charity evaluators, founders pledge, and so on. All of these things just wouldn't exist. So let's zoom in on someone, uh, on what someone might need to start a charity to address, right? So here's a slum in Lucknow in India, for example, and we see the need for charities maybe to focus on sanitation or education, nutrition, uh, causing stunted development in children, economic barriers maybe, uh, but then there's violence, particularly violence against women, and so on and so on. And this is just in one slum. But what if we zoom out to the entire city? Well, there's 65,000 slums in Lucknow alone. And then if we zoom out far more to the, to the entire province, we see many more. And then if we zoom out to the whole country and indeed out to the whole world. So there's just so much uh, need, there's so much uh, scope for charities. And that's not to mention all of the other problems and opportunities that we could say, you know what, I'm going to do it. I'm going to step up to the plate. Mental health, uh, forced migration, food security, gender inequality, peace, so on, bio-risk. There's just so many areas and so few people willing to step up to the plate. It's very neglected. How many people would you say are actually working on AI safety at the moment? Okay, it's AI, AGI in particular, is, is potentially going to very negatively affect billions of lives in the future. And yet some estimate that as few as 300 people are actually working as their job full time, specifically on AI safety, 300 people on the entire planet. So I think there's room for a few more. Uh, what percentage of EA funding is actually being deployed at the moment? Would you say it's 50%? Would you say it's 10%? Well, it's probably closer to 1% simply because there aren't enough great charities to invest in. There was a recent call for, for ideas and uh, projects. Uh, FTX got 1,700 applications and funded about 70 of them. So there just isn't enough really high quality um, charities being started. We need a pipeline. We need a pipeline for GiveWell and for animal charity evaluator type charities to take, and these take years to get going through the piloting stage, and we're not seeing enough coming through. Um, then consider the number of EAs, right? Let's, let's just say very simply that there's 20,000 of us. Um, with most orgs having about 10 staff or so on average. So that means we would need to create like about 1,900 new organizations just to absorb the current talent pool to get everyone working on the world's most pressing problems. The most upvoted um, uh, post on the EA forum was about how frustrating and how frustrating it is that there's so few jobs in EA. And this is only going to get more pronounced as EA grows. It'll take leaders, founders, people who, people like you, who say, you know, well, we can't wait for someone else to do it. I have to step up. And don't forget, you don't need to be absolutely the smartest person, the best founders. They, what they do is they create containers and then attract the smartest people into them and give them, you know, the, the place within which they can work on really important stuff. Currently, we have hundreds of super smart researchers without clear direction. And the best, best bit is you can use those super smart people to figure out the direction. Um, but they need leadership. They need somebody to step up to the plate and say, right, we're going to do this together. Lastly, just consider the replaceability here. So, you know, maybe there's another job that you're considering and maybe it's an ops job in an EA org. Great. Super. But it's very likely that somebody else would be willing to take that job and they do a good job. Whereas when it comes to starting a new organization, then it's, it's very unlikely that somebody will step up to the plate and take your place. So all of that impact that you could have kind of evaporates if that's the case. Okay, so moving on, can we remove the barriers and get these kinds of charities launched? And if we do, do they have the impact? Well, to address this, the first thing I need to say, and I need to be very, very clear in this, is that 
CE, Charity Entrepreneurship, our organization, our organization, doesn't have the monopoly on starting charities at all. In fact, most of the exceptional charities in the world, nearly all EA orgs, for example, weren't started by Charity Entrepreneurship. Um, but given that I work with CE, um, it's what I can speak to and it's what I know more about. So we're going to be focusing there. But I just want to make that very clear from the start. OK, so in CE, through our program of starting charities, about 40% are estimated to exceed the cost effectiveness of the strongest charities in their fields and have been supported by multiple independent bodies like Open Philanthropy, GiveWell, EA Funds, that kind of thing. So we reckon about 40% of those that come on the program, of the charities that we start, will go on to become GiveWell recommended or equivalent leaders in their respective fields. About 40% or two fifths make real progress, but remain at a smaller scale. And about one fifth shut down in their first 24 months or so without having had a significant impact, which by the way, is something that we really encourage because if the program isn't working and uh, the pilots come back with information that it just hasn't worked, it's great to pivot and move to something else. So we, we would seek that. Um, but just contrast that for a moment in the for-profit world where you typically see about 90% of um, startups failing. Here we're at about a 20%. And I don't think failure really captures what happens here. It's more like the founders identify something that's even more powerful that they could be doing and they go off and do that. So let's look now at our track record. Uh, in the five years that Charity Entrepreneurship has existed, we've launched 31 new charities. Um, if you have a look at the logos down the bottom, you'll see the whole range, the spread from mental health charities to animal advocacy charities to global health and development. Um, and you might recognize some of the, the logos and go, oh, I didn't realize that they were launched through Charity Entrepreneurship. Collectively, they've reached over t about 20 million people and they've helped uh, maybe 1 million animals or more. And we're on track, we believe, to, for that figure to rise pretty steeply to uh, 1 billion annually. Hello, you're very welcome. Hello, you're very welcome. Your career, talent and time. And, and you get into what Charity Entrepreneurship does, uh, what our incubation program is all about and how we aim to help you and how we help, we aim to address those barriers. Uh, it's certain 20 staff, 40 staff, and, and many of them are still at that very small, you know, like one or two people operating, but still having significant impact. So we're very proud of our charities. There's a whole bunch of other benefits uh, to this career path. You can have a quick look at them on the screen there. Um, building your, your skills and your career capital, it's incredibly fast. Um, the job satisfaction is just off the charts and so on. And then there's a whole bunch of uh, intangible um, follow through effects as well, or flow through effects. But that's a whole bunch of pros um, for becoming a founder, but what about the cons? Uh, it's certainly challenging and it's definitely not for everyone. Um, so why not? Why would you not start a charity and do this? Well, our best estimate is that if you can, for example, earn to give and donate more than 200 grand, $200,000 per year to give well, then you would probably be better off doing that than being a founder on average. So it's kind of the expected value of each founder that comes through the program is roughly the equivalent to 200,000 a year. So if you can do more than that by earning to give, we suggest you do that. And um, Secondly, if you have a really, really strong idea and you've done a huge amount of research on it and a lot of experience in it and its cost effectiveness and its expected value are super high, then maybe stay and do that. We don't have the monopoly on good ideas equally. You can send us your idea and we may conclude that the best thing to do is to start an org with that idea and to help you do so. And um, also, if you have a comparative advantage or domain expertise in something especially impactful, then it's possible that really leveraging that could be better. Some people are just really well placed for careers in high impact policy, for example. And don't be a founder if it just doesn't line up for you, if it just doesn't feel like this sits well with your values. Um, and there's, you know, a whole bunch of challenges that come with it as well. You know, there's uncertainty, it's failure, you know, that can happen. And there's financial limitations, it can be quite lean for the first few years. And um, work-life balance can be very tricky, you know, and so if you've uh, recently had big changes in your life, maybe if this isn't the ideal time, but that's for you to consider. And importantly, I think it's worth saying that the work just isn't very glamorous. Uh, I spend nearly all my time in meetings or in Google Docs. And um, so, yeah, just consider what it would be like to be actually doing this.
And then there are the really big barriers. And this is what we really want to speak about today. So, you know, you have to have a really good quality idea, one that's well researched, that makes sense, that, you know, has the ability to translate or potentially translate into a, a huge amount of real impact. Um, you'll need a great co-founder that will complement your skills and your strengths, and you'll need a bunch of skills and knowledge, not to mention there's all the red tape and the admin and the network and all that kind of stuff. And lastly, of course, you can need the funding. So it's, you know, there's a lot of challenges and barriers here. So with all of that in mind, let's get into what charity entrepreneurship does. Uh, what our incubation program is all about and how we aim to help you and how we help we aim to address those barriers and to be the antidote as it were. So our mission at Charity Entrepreneurship is for more, in, uh, more high impact charities to exist in the world. Um, we are, let's say, roughly 50% a research organization and 50% an incubation and training org. The research team spends over a thousand hours a year collecting and identifying the most promising charity ideas. Uh, and then we recruit, train and fund people like you to start them. And that's why we're here today. Uh, so we've built a program to address all the major barriers. Uh, we provide you with the idea. So that's where the research team comes in. I'm gonna to speak to that just for a moment and then we'll come back to the other parts of the program. So how this works? Well, each year the research team goes out to the community and the literature and searches for literally hundreds of ideas for promising charities. Uh, they then get all these ideas get pushed into a funnel and get kind of um, go through multiple rounds of increasingly in-depth research to find the very best three or so ideas. So we start with hundreds and we whittle them all down to three. It's a very negative process where we're constantly removing ideas because they didn't quite match up. And traditionally the research has targeted um, ideas that are at least five times as effective as the Against Malaria Foundation. Um, so that, that changes depending on how hit space we're uh, trying to be and things change over time, but that's a good kind of simplistic uh, benchmark to have in your mind. So one of our ideas, if you pick it up and run with it, you are starting with something that has an, a, an amazing amount, I think, of promising uh, in the core concept, prom promisingness, let's go with that, in the core concept. Here are some of the ideas that we're uh, interested in launching and because once the research process is, is finished, what we do is we turn these ideas into quite in-depth reports and we publish those on our website. And um, so these are the ideas we're, we're going with. Okay, so that's the, the funnel. So once we have the ideas in place, then we attract people onto the program. Um, and we do an awful lot of time, we do an awful lot of effort and time goes into recruiting and vetting to find potential founders to come on our two month incubation program to get trained up to actually start these ideas. Uh, so we typically receive over a thousand or more, maybe even 2000 applications. And we take between changes all the time, but between 20 and 40 people uh, roughly are coming on the program. So it is highly competitive. We do recruit from all over the world. And the reason we're here today is because we know that the next founders are likely, you know, could be in this conference. So um, here are some of the people we've recruited in the past. You see that there's a good geographic spread. Um, and here's a happy bunch of incubatees from uh, from one of the previous programs. So uh, what is the incubation program and how does it all work? Well, first of all, we do cover stipends before, uh, sorry, during and after the program. So this covers your cost of living because it's full time. It's seven weeks with one, uh, one week, uh, seven weeks online with one week in person. Um, we bring you into this community of uh, founders and so you're wrapped in with the other founders who have gone before you and can learn from them and their templates and that kind of stuff. We provide legal admin and bookkeeping support and getting you past the red tape and the templates and all that kind of stuff. And we give you access to the seed funding network and we've, I'll come into that in a moment, but basically we have a 100% success rate in uh, getting funding within about a week of the projects uh, being kind of um, articulated. So how does the program go? Well, it starts off with six weeks book club, about an hour a week getting to know each other and the theory. Um, so this gets a lot of the reading and the, uh, the theory out of the way before the program starts properly. So after about six weeks of doing that, then the program kicks off. And like I said, it's seven weeks, it's full on. It's very, very full time. Uh, and there's one week in person, typically in London, where we bring you over. Uh, we put you up, make sure that uh, costs are covered for that. Um, but yeah, so it's it's roughly seven or eight weeks long. And when I came on the program about just over a year ago, I thought we'd come in on Monday morning as the first day and we'd meet Joey or we'd meet one of the other great lecturers and they'd introduce themselves and we'd go through a talk and then we'd like 
go into Zoom rooms and we'd go to breakouts and all this kind of stuff. Wasn't like that at all, not even a little bit. Monday morning of the first day, we get this email which says, hey, here are the 10 projects or assignments you're to do for the week. And here are the 10 people from the program you're to do them with. Uh, so you're just thrown straight into the deep end. Here's a bunch of lectures. Here's, here's the assignments, now go. So I was a bit shocked, but uh, I thought it was very cool. I loved it. And we're just straight into the thick of it, trying to build, trying to, you know, you bump into things, you get loads of feedback, you're working with the other participants on the program. So really what's going on is that for the first month of the program, you're trying out these different uh, assignments and you're trying your fit with the other, you know, uh, incubatees, the other participants on the program. So in the morning, I might be working with one of them on a pitch or um, a budget. And in the afternoon, I might be working with another person from the program uh, on, a, you know, five-year plan or some kind of m &E strategy or something like that. So you're getting to try out what it's like working with these people in fast-paced, challenging assignments that have clear deadlines. And it's a very good way to understand how well you work together. And then at the end of each week, you give feedback to CE to say, hey, I got on really, really well with this person, not so much with that person, and I'm leaning more and more towards this idea. So as the weeks move on, you're narrowing in and we're giving you more time with the people that you work better with and less time with the people who uh, your match isn't quite so good with. So you're getting cl closer and closer. So roughly by the end of the first month, you've decided who you want to work with and which charity idea you're most kind of excited by and have best kind of comparative advantage for. And then you spend the second month working with that person on that charity idea for real now. So rather than doing the assignments kind of um, for the sake of doing the assignments in the second month, you're doing them to actually build the, you know, the project plan, the measurement and evaluation, the budget for the charity that you're now going to launch. So that by the end of the second month, you have this stack of, of projects that are all done. And that's going to enable you to put that together into a proposal for funding. And it's that proposal for funding that CE then take away, bring it to their uh, network of, of funders, of seed, seed funders. And typically within a week or so, um, nearly all of the projects get funded uh, and we're seeing people get funding of up to $200,000. Uh, so it takes about a week, and then about a week later, the funding arrives in your bank account, and a week later, you've launched the charity. So it's very, very immediate upon, uh, upon completion of the program, if that's what you choose to do. So some of the stuff that's actually on the program, uh, some of the content would be monitoring and evaluation, some basic, basic statistics, uh, a lot on uh, decision making. The majority of it is around decision making and re making really, really good quality decisions even under uncertainty about what direction your charity is going to take. Um, so you'll, you'll work on task management, organizational prioritization, um, forming a board, budgets and legalities, all these kinds of things, um, all very supported, all with templates. And you know, people have done all of this before when you come to it. So you're very much like going, okay, how has it been done in the past? Right, We're going to do the equivalent of that for, for this new charity idea in our own way. Um, so like I said, that le leads up to your proposal, which is like, maybe a 10, 15 page document that goes away for, for funding and the seed funding uh, typically comes in within a week, as I said. Um, so in short, charity entrepreneurship, we have the ideas, we have the funding. Uh, what we need are more courageous people to step up to the plate and say, you know what, I'm willing to give this a really good shot. A um, couple of examples now. So we're gonna take a step back and take a quick look at a few people who have done this in the past. Uh, so who people who have come on our program and where they're at now. So the first example is Fortify Health. So this is Nikita and Brandon, uh, two young people, uh, no majorly relevant experience, but they stepped up uh, to work to reduce anemia and its long-term health effects, particularly in children at scale in India by partnering with uh, mills who fortify to fortify flour with iron and folic acid and vitamin B12 and that kind of thing. So it's such a simple idea in one sense. We need to get these vital nutrients into millions of kids, right? To stave off all sorts of health problems. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, we could send out tablets, but that's extremely expensive and then they're not necessarily gonna take them and you know, we, it's very hard to track. So what if we just put the nutrients into the flour at source in the major mills uh, and then that gets distributed to the wholesalers who in turn distribute it to the bakers who in turn distribute it to the villages. Uh, so this is working. You know, we're a few, few years on and they're delivering those crucial nutrients to about 192,000 children every single day. Uh, this has been so effective 
uh, that GiveWell have just um, given Fortify Health a $8.2 million uh, grant, scale-up grant. Um, so just, just take a moment just to, to think that through for a moment. Two young people, just like you, started this charity, and a few years on, they're getting $8 million from GiveWell, and they're getting their nutrients into 192,000 children every single day. What would it feel like if you woke up tomorrow and you knew that because of you, it was 192,000 children that were getting that kind of thing? Um, just think about how that would feel. I know it's a very un-EA thing to do. It's just to actually tap into your feelings and imagine what it would be like to get up in the morning and do that. But I think it's a really important thing. Does that excite you? Does that fill you with, uh, with motivation? Okay, so that's Nikita and Brandon. Next up, we have the Fish Welfare Initiative. So this is Tom and Haven, um, and they were incubated in 2019, and their organization improves the welfare of farmed fish, primarily in India. Fish are very numerative. <laughs> There's an awful lot of fish being farmed, and it's good reason to think that they are very capable of a lot of suffering. So um, the, what the guys in the Fish Welfare Initiative have been doing is they've been collaborating with farmers to improve the water quality and to lower the stock densities of the fish in these farms. Um, and so far, um, it's, it's over a million fish or a million, a million animals as a consequence of their work that aren't spending pretty much their entire lives gasping for oxygen, thanks to, to Tom and Haven and the team. So again, we're thinking about what would it feel like if you if that was very salient for you, would that be very motivating? Third example, Family Empowerment Media. Uh, so this is Anna, Christina and Ken. Uh, and what they do is they run ads educating families, primarily in Nigeria, about contraception and family planning. So radio programs, radio ads, just basically saying, hey, here's some facts about contraception. And uh, they did one, uh, they did a, a three month pilot uh, relatively recently, and it's estimated just that one pilot alone has been estimated to have averted 70 maternal deaths. And by 26, 2026, they expect to be able to avert a death for $2,600. So that's 30% more cost effective than even GiveWell's most cost effective charities. 30% plus their intervention is super scalable. So we have very high hopes for, for FEM. They've done amazing work to date. And yeah, it just seems like another standout charity. The most effective charity of them all, and I'm kidding here clearly, is Training for Good because I co-founded it. Um, uh, so together with Jan Willem and Killian, we are an EA meta, meta charity and we provide training and placements uh, to uh, highly into highly promising career paths. So we're helping people like you break into impactful careers in journalism, in bio policy and AI policy. And um, so it's a very different type of charity than the ones I was mentioning before. So I just wanted to illustrate that. And um, some common concerns that we often talk to people about. So some things that might be going on in your mind is um, I don't have a great idea. That's fair. Uh, I didn't have a great idea for a charity when I started it. Uh, I was lucky enough to pick up one of the charity entrepreneurship ideas. So that's one of the reasons we do that is that it's very rare to come across um, a great entrepreneur who also has done the research. Uh, so yeah, hopefully you understand that. Um, you prefer your own idea. That's absolutely fine. Or CE's ideas aren't for you. So two things on this. Yes, if you do have your own idea, we would love to hear from you. Um, but do recognize that our bar is, you know, it typically or traditionally it was five times uh, as effective as the Against Malaria Foundation in expectation. So if it's significantly lower than that, then, you know, grapple with why we would want to really put all our energy into starting that rather than one of these other ideas, because then obviously we would be losing the difference. Um, alternatively, you might just feel, oh, OK, so none of the particular ideas on the ticket this year, as it were, are for me. None of those animal ideas or none of those bio risk ideas are particularly uh, lighting me up. That's totally fair. I would say, however, that one of the most common things we hear from the participants on the program is that how often they change their mind. And I certainly experienced this myself, that during the program, I was constantly pivoting between different ideas. I, as I learned more about them, I got much more excited. Um, and so to take a cursory look at the ideas as they are on, in the reports and then go, yeah, that, that doesn't really do it for me, I think is kind of missing an opportunity. So expect yourself 
to if you were to engage with it more and really dig in and really think through the cost effectiveness and the level of impact that's potentially there. Uh, expect that your motivation for that idea would significantly rise. There's very good evidence that that's the case um, from uh, everybody else who's been on the program or many other people that have been on the program. Uh, another misconception or concern is that there's, you know, 3,000 people are going to apply for this and, you know, I won't get in. It's totally fair. Yes, the majority of people will not get in because it's a, you know, it's a, it's a recruitment funnel. Um, and that's always the case. But it's more like, is the upside worth the effort. And I'll speak in a couple of moments about um, our application process and how we've tried to make that as valuable as possible. But also, I would just qualify this 3000 number and say, look, in real terms, we don't get 3000 applica applications, we get a number of 100 applications per round, and um, that are highly relevant, and that the people are, you know, well versed in what we do, and have really read the website and stuff. So we get an awful lot of applications that aren't really applicable, shall we say. So if you're an EA and you're attending a conference like this, you're definitely in the the, the running, you know, you're in the, the mix of people that are quite likely to get in. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I, rack, I, I lack the relevant expertise. Well, yeah, I think this is a, a legitimate concern. Um, I think there is a lot of I don't know, there's a lot of expectation that you're supposed to be superhuman, have like just be unbelievably high performing and these kinds of things. And it's just not true. It's not fair. And yes, we recruit for very, very good people, but we don't recruit for superhuman people. And when it comes to expertise specifically, and I mean, almost none of us have the expertise in the particular charity idea that we we go ahead and launch. Jack and Lucia didn't know much about lead exposure or lead poisoning before they they started that. Family Empowerment Media didn't know anything about radio ads before they started, and so on and so on. It's it's just the same story again and again. It's more, are you willing, not are you a 100% expert today, it's more, are you willing to commit to this and to become an expert over the two months of the program and the first year of running your charity? It's, are you willing to become obsessed and become an expert rather than uh, are you already one? Um, another common concern is it's very risky, I might fail. This is totally uh, understandable, uh, and yes, it's possible that you'll fail, but I think it's worth really thinking through what you mean by failure. Uh, so failure in the for-profit space might be that you rack up a load of debt, you end up in you know, court, um, you know, bankrupt and these kinds of things, and it's just not possible in the charity sector. You can't actually go into debt. So failure really looks like you spend a year or two giving it a go, um, you learn a bunch of things, and you learn that it doesn't work, and you write that all up, you contribute that to the community and then you pivot away and you do something else, hopefully leveraging a lot of the experience that you've had. That seems to me like pretty much the worst case scenario for failure here, um, which isn't exactly a terrible, terrible, uh, terrible downside. So I think it's worth thinking through what you really are afraid of in terms of failure. Um, we encourage and expect a certain number of the charities to fail because that means we're pushing things and we're pushing things towards their limits. And that's a good thing. So if nobody was failing, then we're clearly nowhere near uh, pushing ourselves hard enough. Um, I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too specialized. It's too far away. All of these concerns. Um, so some of these are a little bit more legitimate than others, but in the whole, they're not really things that we bet on or, or pay much attention to, too much attention to in the uh, vetting process. Um, We've had 19 year olds on the program. We've had 60 somethings on the program. I'm certainly one of the older people that's been on the program. Um, but yeah, it's just not something that's a major consideration. Um, you know, it's it, can it be far away? Yes. You know, are you willing to move for this is a, is a good question to ask yourself. The guys who set up the Fish Welfare Initiative, for example, have spent quite a lot of time in India. That's totally, you know, that's a, a part of that deal. Whereas on the other hand, in training for good, uh, we're all still working remotely and probably will for the foreseeable future. Uh, so none of us have had to move at all. So it really depends on what kind of charity you start. Um, I don't know if I'm a good fit is a very common concern we hear. And this is something that's totally reasonable. Of course, you don't know if you're a good fit because you've never been a charity entrepreneur before. So you don't really know what it takes. Plus, you know, we're all very biased about ourselves. We typically in the EA, we have a lot of imposter syndrome and we don't think that we're good enough or that we think other people are even more impressive or whatever happens to be. Um, and I would say that, you know, in this case, it's kind of legitimate that you don't know if you're a good fit, because as I say, um, you've never done this before. 
Um, but we know what makes a good fit because we've been doing this for many years and we've built up a pretty good profile and understanding of what it takes. And we're going to be able to tell you whether or not you'd be a, a really good fit. So the best way to figure out if you if you could be a good fit is to apply and then we'll figure it out together, as it were, rather than, well, I don't know if I'm a good fit and then not applying. Well, then you don't know. You don't learn anything that way. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, you might think that you're not ready. Uh, this can be true, obviously, depends on how uh, how fresh out of college you might be or how fresh out of school you might be, whatever it happens to be. Um, and we'll say that we've had people on the program and people who started up charities that didn't finish college. We've had people who have a lot of experience and then came into it and realized, whoa, my experience just actually isn't nearly as relevant as I thought it was. I'm going to have to learn here. So your readiness isn't really, are you ready on day one? It's really rather can you get ready by using the program? Because remember, obviously nobody is ready to start a charity. That's what the program's for. But can you get ready over the course of trying it for the first year or so? So the way I think about the program is the program isn't two months. It's two months plus the first year of really trying to figure out what your charity is all about and that kind of thing. Do you think that you'd be ready by the end of that process? And if that excites you, then very cool. Um, yeah. Um, it's a big leap, and I don't know if I want to give up everything that I've been doing. Uh, so this is very fair. Uh, and it kind of stems on from the last point is that it seems like an enormous commitment. You know, I'm going to completely change my life, go down this route, and then I'm kind of going down that path and I'm locked in. And I don't think that's a, I don't think it's a particularly accurate way of looking at it. Uh, so to illustrate this, I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, Federico came on the program last year, the same year I did it. And uh, he was an engineer and worked a lot with drones and was working a very good job in an engineering organization and wasn't sure that if he wanted to give up all of that and, you know, all of the years he had spent training to be an engineer and pivot into this. He just wasn't sure. Of course, he couldn't be sure because he hadn't done the program yet. He hadn't even met his co-founder and he didn't know what idea he was going to do. So how does he make that decision? Well, what he did was he said, I'm just going to make the decision to dip my toe. So. He went to his, his uh, employers and he said, I'd like to take a month uh, unpaid leave to uh, explore this program. So he came on the program and after two or three weeks, he realized, wow, this really is something that I want to explore a lot further. So he goes back to his employer and he says, hey, I need a second month off. And they grumbled and they said, OK. So he continued through with the program, met his co-founder, Devin, uh, agreed that they were going to launch HIP got very good indications that they were likely to get funded. And, you know, in weeks six, six or seven or eight or something of the program, finally went back to his boss and said, hey, yeah, this is what I want to do with my life. Um, you know, and they said they grumbled a lot more at <laughs> this time. And they said, right, fine. Well, you you still have to work off, off your contract. And he said, oh, I know. So he went back to work for them for, the, for a month after finishing the program to finish out his contract and then left and then pivoted into his new uh, charity, which is, is doing great. So I think it's not fair on yourself to expect you to be able to make this huge decision about your entire future uh, without a lot of information. And you won't have that information until after you go on the program and until after you meet your founder and until after and so on. So give yourself a bit of a break and say, I'm not taking this massive leap in one go. I'm really just committing to doing the program and then seeing how it goes from there. Um, I applied and I didn't get in. This is a very common concern. Again, we'll just say that obviously most people who apply don't get in. That's the nature of it. So you need to take that on the chin. Um, and people have applied following years and have got on. And um, so one person in particular applied four times and got in and has just launched what I think is potentially one of the highest impact charities that we, we, we will ever launch, in fact. So a uh, particularly strong candidate, but it took them a few goes to, to get ready. OK, um, yeah, one other concern that just pops into mind is that, you know, should I go away and get more experience first? And I just very quickly ask you to or invite you to think through that and say, well, which would be better? You getting two, two or three years experience working in another job and then starting the charity? Or would it be better to do two or three years of trying to start the charity and then running the charity? So, you know, cumulatively, I think it's more about the relevance of your experience to what you end up doing that really that really matters. Okay, how does the application process work if you didn't want to apply? Well, 
Uh, first off, you do a psychometric tool, which is a bunch of questions. I think it's 60 questions or something, and you upload your CV, and we're going to be able to give you quite a lot of feedback. So everybody now who applies will get feedback on how well suited they are. Uh, so that's kind of exciting, and we're hoping that that's just like net value, valuable for you, regardless of whether you progress. If you make it through to the, the first test task then, so this is round two, we ask you to compare your various um, career opportunities and to go through quite a kind of a rigorous analytical process of comparing and contrasting them. Um, if you make it through that, you're in the top 5% or so. Um, then you are, we're doing a recorded interview with you, and then we do a second test task, which is all around us understanding your thinking and your rationale, and then the final uh, interview. So it's quite in-depth if you make it all the way through. It takes uh, possibly about 10 hours, but we don't ask you to do all that much unless you're progressing through and it seems very likely that it's worth your while and and the first two components the two big components at the start uh, they're both designed to be very useful to you regardless of what you of whether or not you progress um, and that's the feedback we keep getting year on year is that you know, particularly that second test task wow that was really valuable to me and i actually decided i don't want to progress with charity entrepreneurship i want to do this other thing and we're like super we helped you to decide um, so yeah so finally just to close up um, imagine Rob Mather hadn't started the Against Malaria Foundation, or imagine Joey hadn't started Charity Entrepreneurship, GiveWell, OpenPhil, CEA, EAGs, the whole lot. And then just imagine, well, where could you fit into all of that? What's the, the small thing potentially that you could start that one day could become big? Because none of those guys had any sense of how big their, their operations would become. Um, so just consider that one day you could be on that list, as it were. Um, and lastly, just please go on our website, charityentrepreneurship.com, take the quiz, really consider this, think it through, see how much of this applies to you, um, and then apply and or uh, see you at the, um, the office hours later on in this conference. So yeah, thanks guys, and uh, hopefully see you soon. Thank you, Steve, for that wonderful talk. And now we'll head straight to the Q&A. So I've looked at the questions available on the live feed and arranged them by themes. Here's the first question. What would you recommend for someone to do after this talk if they want to generally test their fit for this path or work towards becoming a great charity founder? Yep. Um, so I would suggest the first thing to do is to have a look at a couple of videos uh, on our website and we, we can post links here as well. I already have posted some of them, like giving you a better sense of what it's like on the program, uh, some of the challenges and the benefits of the program. So you have a really good sense of what it is. Uh, once you've done that, I would encourage you to sign up to our newsletter so that you can kind of stay in touch with us and kind of get the latest updates. And then probably the most concrete thing is that we have this quiz on our website which asks like 24 questions, I think it is, um, about your level of fit for this career path. So you can go in there, you can answer those qu those questions as honestly as you can. And then what it does is it actually spits out and produces a kind of a report for you and gives you a sense of how good um, you're, you know, how well you line up with the characteristics and traits that we've noticed in the past are the things that are um, commensurate with success of this this kind of uh, endeavor. So it gives you a really good sense. It's like a narrative approach to uh, exploring whether or not you'd be a good fit. And that's on our website. It's called the Charity Entrepreneurship Quiz. Okay, so you've already mentioned fit and touched on it a bit. So a lot of the questions were actually around that, from age limit to key experiences required to having specific backgrounds or specific expertise. So more broadly, I wanted to ask, what traits do you think the most successful charity founders in our program have? Yeah, so it's it's a really broad, it's actually a really broad question. We have like very neat answers for it because we get asked it an awful lot. And um, again, I just, I put a link in the chat box and let me just find the correct link here. Um, it's called, who's a good fit for our program? And I'll put that in in the chat now because it's like it's worth delving into this in a bit of detail rather than me just giving you the very like top level highlights uh so that's in there now as well um but yeah broadly speaking uh they kind of there's there's five main things that we think are particularly important um and the top of that list is much more important than probably the rest right so the, the most important thing is are you ambitious about having impact are you morally ambitious do you want to have not just a lot of impact but you want to use your career to maximize your impact. 
And that kind of the difference between wanting to have a lot and wanting to really, really go for it seems to be the the, the key differentiator that we we notice amongst the best founders. Um, then the, the the then there's four others, right? Sorry. Um, so, and by the way, Rika can jump in as well. She works on the vetting team and is very involved in this. So I might hand over to Rika in a moment. But yeah, the, another one uh, that's very important is kind of taking a very skeptical approach. Uh, I think most organizations outside of this space, like, you know, that start charities and stuff, they essentially go looking for the evidence that their idea is working. Whereas our founders are built to essentially go for looking for the evidence that it might not be working. And then if they fail at figuring out that it's not working, then it kind of implies that it is. So it's taking a much more scientific, much more skeptical approach um, really rig rigorous or as rigorous as is possible in your domain um, and looking for convergences of, of evidence or uh, triangulation of evidence. So like we'll look at this source of evidence that looks good with we'll another source of evidence that, that what we're doing is working. And if a third one comes in, yeah, OK, we probably are what we're doing probably is working. But the default is to assume that what we're doing isn't working. Uh, Rika, do you want to add one or two? Yeah, so another one is startup culture fit. Are you someone who is able to work autonomously? As a charity founder, you won't have a boss breathing down your neck, letting you do things and meet deadlines. You'll be setting up these things for yourself. Are you able to work like that? Another thing I want to build on where Steve mentioned scientific mindset, because as a founder, you'll be making a lot of decisions. You don't need to be the smartest person in the room or have an A's in all A's in your classes, but we want someone who can look at the evidence and is able to weigh them according to importance and how accurate this might be. And then take into account a lot of things before making a decision. Another thing that I think a lot of people underestimate is having a collaborative personality. As a charity founder, you will be collaborating with a lot of people. Whatever charity you launch, you will have stakeholders. Are you able to balance these relationships and get people to buy into your charity idea. And even those who don't, how do you are you how are you able to work with them and still churn out good results despite potential problems interpersonally? So these are the traits that we look for. And I would recommend that even though you're not sure if you're a good fit, just apply. Like the best test we've found for people to take to see if they might be a good fit, especially for the time it takes, is to just apply once the applications are out in early February or March next year, because the first step is only 30 minutes, then you have a good preview of whether or not you could be a good fit. It's a faster feedback loop. So I would recommend that. Yeah, we, we get an awful lot of people spending huge amount of time reading and discussing and talking to people. Will I apply? Won't I apply? And they're, they're spending far more time thinking about whether or not they should apply than just applying. Uh, and it's really hard to know whether or not you'd be a good fit for this because you've never done this, right? You don't know what it takes, but we've been doing it now for many years. We've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs at this point. So we have a, a pretty good sense uh, so therefore, like give the give that kind of decision over to us a little bit. It seems to to make sense. The other thing is that we have our handbook, the how to launch a high impact nonprofit. It's available on Amazon. I put a link in the chat earlier, and it goes through all of the kind of the pros and cons of the of uh, of the career path. Um, but mainly the thing I want to focus with this on or with this is my very tongue tied this morning. Um, is that roughly 50% of the pages in the book are about different decision-making tools. And as a founder, your job every day will be to get up and make decisions, mainly under quite high levels of uncertainty. And the charities that do really well are because the founders, you know, on average are making slightly better decisions by using better tools that are in the book uh, and, and similar tools. Um, and therefore, on aggregate, you know, you put it all together over time and the trajectory of a better a charity is what falls out. Should we move on to another question, Rika? Yes. So we touched a little bit on the applications and potential next steps. There's a question the incubation program itself. And maybe you can just talk a little bit more about that structure of the program. So one person asked about post-launch. Is there ongoing support once the charity is launched? But maybe you could talk about it more broadly as well. Yeah. So we put in like, 
I don't know, thousands of hours to try and identify these ideas at the start. You know, like the research team literally spends thousands of ideas uh, of hours a year to come up with like three to five ideas. And then we recruit from thousands and thousands of people. And then we get those people and those ideas and we put them together for two months on the program, having invested pretty much a year of work. And then once they're through the program, we just drop them off a cliff and say, see ya. No, I'm only kidding. Obviously, we continue to invest because we've already put so much investment into these things. We think they're so high potential. We basically try and create as fruitful a relationship as we can with everybody and then maintain that relationship into the future. The best resource that our new charities have are our old, older charities because they've gone through so many of the, the similar um, challenges. So we've created an ecosystem or a community um, where we have a suite of supports. We have monthly meetings. We have you know, we all meet up in the office every so often. We have online stuff. We have ongoing coaching and mentoring from the most senior staff to the newer charities. Uh, we connect the older charities to the newer charities. Uh, we have a resource hub where we get everybody's templates. Oh, somebody's figuring out how to do an implementation partners thing over here. Well, why don't we take what's generic of that and make that available to everybody? And we just, we have legal and accounting support. We have um, fiscal sponsorship support so that you can just launch your charity instantaneously. Um, and I mean that literally within a week of, of launching, of, of getting our funding, we had launched uh, because of, of the way we can incorporate underneath uh, an umbrella fiscal sponsor. So basically our entire organization exists for the success of the charities that we launch. So yes, we definitely, definitely continue to support you. I'm noticing we're probably out of time. Yes, we're pressed for time for that. So that's it for the session. If you have any more questions, please join Steve's office hours happening right after this talk. Thank you, everyone.